session. This is the last session in the maternal shock and collapse. And the respiratory morbidity in critically ill patients, I will just make it simple by discussing two things. Either there is fluid overload, so you got pulmonary edema, and this pulmonary edema is the cardiogenic pulmonary edema, which occurs with fluid overload or with myocardial, severe myocardial depression or with massive hypertension or pulmonary hypertension. So there is a cardiogenic cause and this is the one we deal with when we give excess fluids or when the patient goes into shock and in the shock state there is myocardial depression so there is right-sided failure as well as left-sided failure. And the other one is the non-cardiogenic. The non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema is the old terminology. It's now changed to acute lung injury or adult respiratory distress syndrome. So if it's a non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema, there is a treatment we will discuss right now. But if it's cardiogenic, the main treatment is the frusamide, is to give lasix in order to drain some fluid which is excess in the body. And you know, the fluid balance in the body by either the patient is attached to a central venous pressure monitor or you are uh, monitoring the pulmonary artery pressure through the invasive monitoring that we talked about previously. Of course, sometimes pulmonary edema is so severe you need oxygen support and to increase the oxygen delivery to the blood by CPAP, by uh, uh, ventilation. but. The need of ventilation is not as frequent as if you have acute adult respiratory distress syndrome. So if there is pulmonary edema, you have to differentiate. Is this pulmonary edema cardiogenic or non-cardiogenic? If it's non-cardiogenic, this is the acute respiratory distress syndrome or the adult respiratory distress syndrome or the old terminology, this is the uh, non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema and it's also called acute lung injury. All these refer to one thing, there is increased capillary permeability, pulmonary edema with the criteria of respiratory failure and no heart failure. So this is purely lung issue. So that's why it's a respiratory distress. The heart, there is no evidence of heart failure. There is hypoxemia and there is a respiratory failure which is evidenced now as defined by the usual definition that we said before when we investigated shock, a pressure oxygen less than 60 millimeters mercury, saturation less than 90%, or the ratio between the pressure oxygen, which is usually 100 normally, to the fractional inspired oxygen, the fraction of oxygen in air is 21%. So if you divide 100, which is the pressure of oxygen, divided by 21, percent which is the fraction of inspired oxygen in the air the usual result is 400 to 500 now this ratio if it drops to 300 this is respiratory failure if it's below 200 then this may define the need for a ventilator and the radiographic findings of pulmonary infiltrates now the etiology of adult respiratory distress syndrome as we said in the previous session it can be transfusion reaction it can be sepsis it can be prolonged hemorrhage and shock. It can be pneumonia, tocolytic therapy, and the embolism, cerebral hemorrhage. So the causes are not only uh, the uh, shock state. There are many obstetric causes that can lead to adult respiratory distress syndrome. And there are non-obstetric causes, connective tissue diseases, substance abuse, irritant inhalations, drug overdose, sickle cell crisis, to a tuberculosis, trauma, a lot of things. So what we do is that as all causes of critically ill patients, you have to treat the cause. Why this patient went into uh, ARDS? Treatment of the cause is your main objective. And that's what I have been fighting for since we started these 12 sessions. That the first thing you do in DIC, treat the cause. The first thing you do if acidosis, treat the cause. The first thing you do in ARDS, treat the cause. This is guidelines. Some physicians leave the cause and start treating the ARDS and putting the patient on ventilator and, 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 and sepsis is still going on. And we said continuing sepsis is fatal, continuing shock is fatal, continuing whatever is fatal. So you have to stop the cause. So this is your first target. And then there is a decision to take to put the patient on ventilator or not. Ventilation, I will give you a little hint about it. It's not a physiological process. Actually, it leads to a lot of derangements. 
So you have to balance between the oxygen saturation and between the need for uh, ventilation in order to use it wisely. And usually we give thromboprophylaxis in order to avoid DVT. We said it before and we say it again. Correction of anemia is the best correction that can be done to improve oxygen delivery to tissues. So you have two steps in the oxygen. First, delivery of oxygen to the blood and then the blood delivers it to the tissues. To deliver oxygen to the blood, this needs you to overcome the barrier of the pulmonary edema that occurred. But to deliver oxygen to tissues, this is by correction of anemia. So correction of anemia cannot be understated. If you need to ventilate the patient, you must have reasonable goals in order not to cause injury to the patient. And we will look at the ventilator in a minute. So the reasonable goals are, I want a pressure oxygen uh, more than 60 millimeters mercury, saturation more than 90%, and I want to reach this with, uh, with oxygen content in the inspired uh, air that I will provide less than 50%. The goal for me as an obstetrician, I will always be asked if a patient is going to be put on ventilator, should we terminate or not? Actually, termination in these cases is called resuscitative cesarean or resuscitative hysterotomy if the uterus is above 20 weeks. We should do it because when you understand the ventilation and how the ventilator works, presence of the uterus means that I have to use higher pressure, higher ventilator pressures, either inspiratory pressure or end expiratory pressure. Using higher pressures means that the, so the thorax is not sucking blood to the thorax anymore. So I'm disturbing the cardiovascular system. Now this is the, this is the normal inspiration. We have 21% fractional inspired oxygen, the rest is nitrogen. So when oxygen moves to the blood, actually there is 80% of the inspired volume present in the alveoli. So the alveoli never collapse. Why? If you are using a ventilator and, for example, use 80% oxygen, this means that the end of expiration, the alveoli will collapse, which is not physiological. So what we do is, we put positive pressure to push oxygen into, or to push air into the lung, and when there is expiration, we also use positive pressure in order to keep the alveoli from collapsing. So this is the end expiratory pressure or the alveoli will collapse. Now this pressure will resist the venous return to the heart. And so this has grave effect on the uh, cardiovascular system. And presence of the uterus means that I have to use more pressure by the ventilator, whether inspiratory or end expiratory, because I'm resisting the pressure from below the diaphragm, the pressure by the uterus. So, the decision to deliver a patient because she's critically ill and on ventilator is an easy decision. Yes, deliver her. Yes, very rare instances, very rare circumstances when you consider another decision. But the usual decision is delivery is resuscitative. It is to help the patient to survive regardless of the gestation age, regardless of the fetal condition, regardless of anything, this is to save the mother. Because a mother on ventilator and the uterus is there, it's very difficult to manage. Because you have to put in, into your mind as an ICU specialist a lot of things. There is, there is the trigger sensitivity. When will the ventilator pump the air? When the patient starts to inspire or will it be at intervals? And sometimes the, the, the pressure goes in while the patient is exhalating. So it's very difficult. You have to address, to address the tidal volume. How much will it be? Too much, it will uh, cause barn trauma. Too little tidal pressure will not give you advantage of oxygenation. You, you have to address the end expiratory pressure. A lot of parameters in the ventilator are very sophisticated. As it is, so it does not need another factor like the gravid uterus. Very the decision of putting the patient on a ventilator because she is critically ill and at the same time continuing pregnancy is there 
but it's hard to take and it needs a lot of parameters and a lot of discussions about the, this patient's case but in considering only the respiratory injury no it is better to deliver the patient if you consider the patient's respiratory functions it is better to deliver for sure if you consider the ventilator settings and the ventilator complications it is better to deliver considering the fetal condition sometimes it's better not to deliver and in if when we do cesarean or we deliver the patient this is resuscitative delivery i need to deliver so she has more chances to stay alive to survive this ordeal of the critically ill uh, condition she is in so usually by default we would deliver the patient very rarely we would give corticosteroids and wait or whatever the icu will uh, negotiate with us and we usually take the decision as a team who is working with the mother in mind more than the fetus i need the mother to survive so i will not trade the mother's life or mother's survival chances of survival for fetal chances of survival no 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 we always will give our attention to mother's survival now this is now we finish the 12 sessions of fighting for maternal life we discuss in these 12 sessions everything obstetric emergencies the physiology the definitions the causes the clinical picture the treatment and the resuscitation and i hope that these sessions can make a change in maternal lives this was my aim from the start and it will always be and i was never i want to tell you that i don't accept maternal deaths and i want you all not to accept maternal death don't believe anyone who tells you that shock is irreversible i swear i have seen patients with severe bleeding refer to hospital hemoglobin one and dic and you do you imagine hemoglobin one percent hemoglobin one gram percent and she survived i witnessed patients with help syndrome liver failure renal failure severe acidosis 6.5 you know in literature they tell you that ph less than 7 there was no survivors in trauma patients in in obstetrics 6.5 and she survived i don't believe there is a reversible shock i believe there is a doctor who gave up the fight early because of literature that led us to accept maternal death because she is severely morbid because whatever no i don't believe from my practice from my point of view from my experience that there is a reversible shock so that's why i don't accept maternal death i accept fighting for the last breath fighting means treating the cause attacking the cause but giving up is not in my dictionary it's not in my vocabulary and i don't want you to give up ever on a maternal life thank you